to 81333. I'm asking for your elevator pitch. Why do you believe what you believe? This is triggered by the book by my next guest. The film uh, God's Not Dead, based on on the evangelist Dr. Rice Brooks book, will be released in London cinemas next week. It's the tale of a Christian student who refuses to be silenced by his bullying atheist professor. It's already grossed over 23 million US dollars in the US and is in the top five US box office ranking, but how will it perform in London? Well, we've been discussing Imam Ajmal Masur's assertion that Christianity was dying out in the East End all morning. And with me now is evangelist Dr. Rice Brooks, author of God's Not Dead and co-founder of Every Nation Church. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Great to have you in the studio. I've been uh, reading uh, some of your book and you make an assertion which I think is quite important uh, for Christians in this country and something I've often argued with my listeners, which is about you need to be able to tell us why you believe what you believe, because if you don't, then people just think you're wishy-washy. Right. Well, first of all, yeah, real faith isn't blind. I went down in writing this book to the Global Atheist Convention uh, down in Melbourne, Australia in 2012, and Richard Dawkins and the, you know, the who's who of the atheist world were there. And that was their assertion that somehow faith is just blind, that we have no reason. You hear insults. Well, it's like the tooth fairy, your imaginary friend. Well, there's no evidence for the tooth fairy. There is evidence for God. And God calls us to come to him not against reason, but through our reason. Christianity calls us to to think and to reason, to examine claims. I mean, I was on an airplane with a woman who told me she was God. And I said, well, if you're God, I've got a lot of questions for you. Mm -hmm. So we we examined, we're skeptics in terms of just, you know, just blatant claims or just assertions. But I believe the evidence for God is all around us as well as within us. Well, we'll talk about the evidence in just a moment. But I'm also interested in, in something you mentioned in the book, which is about secondhand faith, because some people would say, oh, you know, we're just Christians or we're just Muslims or we're just Jews because this is what our family believes in. So it's not necessarily about the individual's faith. It's about the faith of the community. Right. And the movie actually addresses this. It'll be coming out in a few days. Thank you for obviously uh, talking about it. But really, I think as we we are given a faith or we grow up around a faith. And then as we get older, we have to make our own choice. Mm -hmm. And the movie addresses that regardless of where you're from, you have to look at the evidence and say, is this true or not? And that's what happened to me. I looked at the evidence later in life and realized there is a God, and I believe that God revealed himself in Christ. My atheist brother at SMU Law School came home to talk me out of the Christian faith when he found that I'd become a Christian in college. And by the end of that weekend, we baptized him. And he basically said, I think uh, I've been asking a lot of the wrong questions. So we're seeing a phenomenon where people are given the evidence. I think they're making the choice to say, based on the evidence it's reasonable to believe in god and to put my life in that god's hands what are the right questions then to ask i think the first question is why is there something rather than nothing Mm -hmm. the 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 burden on the atheist is enormous to say that everything we see from the complex from from the universe to the complexity of life to consciousness to rationality i mean if we came into existence for no reason why should we trust ours a pointless beginning is a is how could it not be a pointless existence so why is there something rather than nothing mm-hmm. number 2 where did life come from evolution only tells you what happens once you get life it can't explain that very first molecule that very first cell rather and so the complexity is enormous darwin thought that the cell was like a blob of goo he didn't understand that he couldn't look down an electron microscope and see this city of complexity that's in a cell and the third question would be why are we moral Mm-hmm. Interesting, Andrew, who was on a moment ago, as soon as you talked about, well, the, nat- the universe is a natural phenomenon, isn't it interesting that the next question was about ethics? Mm-hmm. So if there is no God, then, then, then why should there, why do, why do we mind, or why are we objecting to people telling lies or, or genocide or anything else like that? But yet we know inside there's a right and wrong. So anyway. But so, and, and, and the, 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 those are valid points. I wonder, though, is for you, it's Christianity. So some would say, I mean, we're coming up to Easter. Some would question the idea that a man who hung on the cross and was crucified, which in itself sounds horrible, and we know is horrible, would become the focus for billions of people. And they would say, we don't understand that. What is it about Jesus that makes him so special? Well, I think you go from the question of, of why is there something rather than nothing? Where did life come from? Why are we moral? The fourth question would be, who can we trust? Mm -hmm. And so 
this invisible, uh, this uncreated God who came, who brought space and time into existence, who is spaceless and timeless, reveals himself in Christ. He becomes a man in Jesus Christ. Uh, yesterday, I was in Jerusalem. Then I've been filming throughout Jerusalem and in, uh, uh, out in Hebron and archaeological digs. Uh, very few people will tell you that Jesus didn't exist or that he didn't die on the cross. So I don't the think the question is really that Jesus exists. I don't think, I think most people would say Jesus does exist. I think, or did exist. I think most people would agree with that. I think the issue for, for many people is around whether he was this triune, part of this triune existence, whether he was the son of God. Right. And that's what the resurrection verifies. When Jesus was raised from the dead in history, I mean, Christianity started in the very place where it would have been easiest to disprove mm-hmm. three days after his death. And so this, uh, this big bang, if you will, there was one at the beginning of the universe. There was a one at the, in the Cambrian explosion 500 million years ago. There was, a, there was an explosion. Something happened 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, and the church was born. And it was a very simple faith, the fact that Jesus was indeed alive. And it wasn't complicated. It wasn't a religious bureaucracy. It was the simple faith that God had revealed himself in Christ, and Jesus verified his identity by the resurrection from the dead. Because in the Bible, the accounts of the resurrection, alongside many of the other accounts, are are variable. And so some people would say, well, you've got one account in, say, Mark, or, you know, another account, account slightly changed in Matthew, et cetera, et cetera. How do you square those up? Well, you know, it really, uh, there's, a, there's a detective named J. Warner Wallace who has, he's, he basically says, the, this, this looks like what eyewitness testimony looks like. You know, if everything, if everybody said exactly the same thing from every perspective, you think, hey, these guys got together and, mm-hmm. uh, and kind of, you know, kind of got their story straight. No, they just told what they saw. The old, but every one of them agrees that he was alive. There's the central facts that he was crucified, that he was buried in a tomb, and that he was resurrected. So all of those accounts, though you may see different perspectives or different camera angles, they all agree in those central facts. And where does science fit in for you as, as, as I would, I presume you would describe yourself as a man of God is what is for you, what does science, does it validate your faith or does it become a bit of a stumbling block? Well, science is wonderful. I mean, science tells us how things work. Mm -hmm. Uh, If I'm looking for Steve Jobs, though, I don't find him by breaking down an iPhone. I don't find Bill Gates by breaking down a computer. So there's difference, a difference in mechanism and agency. So we want to know how things work. We want to know that the universe began. We want to understand the complexity of life and find out answers to disease. And God calls us to that. That's why Christianity rose, or let me say science rather, rose out of a Christian worldview that the universe was understandable. Mm-hmm. Einstein would say this. He'd say the most, mis- the, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that the universe is comprehensible. So the question is, how could something by accident or by ultimate chance have such mathematical order, Mm. have such precision, and and beckon us to investigate and and we're able to find answers? So people of faith do everything they can to understand the world without confusing that if I understand how something works, it must mean that it's by accident. I mean, if I walked into a science lab and I saw an elaborate apparatus, but no scientist present, I would be rational in assuming that an intelligence, an intelligent mind put that apparatus together. And that's why science is wonderful. Mm. But yet it doesn't tell us why we exist. It doesn't tell us the, the sources of these things, for whether it be morals or why the universe exists, why there's something rather than nothing. I'm also interested, one of my callers earlier on was saying that God, and he was referring to God in the Christian mm. Bible, doesn't make it easy for himself. He says that there's all this stuff. He, he says that it's almost as, as if God says that humanity is his enemy. Is that a fair quote? Uh, that humanity is is the enemy of God. Yeah, because no. he said what well, he says that he doesn't make it easy. He says that God doesn't like humans. I oh, mean, God. I'm trying to find the the quote here. <laughs> well, you know, okay, so so that's why becoming a man in Christ, he suffered for us. I mean, Christianity offers us a God that knows what suffering is. He's not a distant God. He's not some some God on Mount Olympus or detached force. Uh, that's oblivious to us. He's, he's the God who is spaceless and timeless, who brought space and time into existence, is also rational, conscious, and personal. And so this is a personal God. This is a God that, that, that understands where we are, that sees. Uh, when one of the Nazis, uh, were, they were having one of the a, a Jewish person dig their own grave in World War II, the, 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 the elderly man looked up and said, God is watching you. 
And that's the very thing that people that do the things they do, uh, whether you're religious or not. I mean, just because you believe in God doesn't mean you're going to do the right thing. And just, and if you're an atheist, you can be good. But where does that goodness come from? It comes from this inborn sense of morality that comes from the Creator. What is more important, though? Is it more important to live a good life now or to live a life that is good only because of the anticipation that you are going to another place? Well, I think it's important to, to be stewards of the life we have. This is the only life we have in terms of physical life. And so there is something to come, yes, but really every, it's, the drama is about what we do right now. So right now counts. And so it's very critical that the talents you have, the gifts you have, uh, the actions you do, all of that counts. I mean, every every email and text and everything we do is now recorded. Mm. And so imagine where that comes from. Imagine in eternity a judgment that we face for, as Jesus said, you'll be judged by every idle word, which makes you kind of want to slow down and watch what mm-hmm. you say. <laughs> But yes, uh, it's both. Right now counts forever, though. What about, I mean, these are the big questions, and I'm sorry I'm throwing them at you, no, but I you've written you. a book. This is why I'm here. Yeah, exactly. God and suffering. This is always the big one. We were just talking earlier on, you probably heard with Andrew about the you know 20 years since the Rwandan genocide. There have been killings all around the world, as you know, both by lots often by you know the root causes being one of religion i.e people saying i you know i need to and this is both christian and muslim and jews you know people going out and killing or maiming in the name of their god and that proves to be becomes a difficulty for many people when it comes right, to religion. Well, the 20th century was the bloodiest century in history and that had it had little to do with religion i mean you look at the the, the regimes of the 20th century and the mass slaughter and genocide these were not religiously motivated mm. uh in fact if there is no god as dostoevsky said then all things are permissible so really only with god do you have an understanding of what suffering is we understand uh, not that there's a purpose for it necessarily other than the fact that without a god then how do we how do we have this sense inside of us that um, that something is right and wrong? Go back to that. But are you saying that you can't be moral without God? Oh, no, no. I think the reason why you are moral, the reason why an atheist can be good and a religious person can be bad, is because we're both created in God's image. And just because I know just because I know there's you know police doesn't mean that I'll slow down and obey the speed limit. So knowing there's a God, knowing there's a moral authority doesn't mean that I'm necessarily going to do the right thing. That's where we have this awesome responsibility of choice. And that's really, when you think about it, most of the suffering we're dealing with is, is, our, is men and women choosing to do the very thing that God says don't do. I mean, yeah, God, but not all the suffering. I mean, if you talk about, I mean, when people are ill, they're not necessarily doing anything wrong. No, no, they're it's just, just a, ill. It's, no, it's right. And I mean, the world we're living in is 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 decaying, if you will. I mean, we we die, uh, life, you know, things break down, cars break down. I mean, we're under this law of entropy, and it lets us know that uh, number one, that we couldn't have been here forever. And so, what is this? What is this world we're living in, where everything is winding down? The, the, you know, stars are burning out. People die. What is what is this? And it points to the fact that there is something beyond ourselves. No one. I mean, look, when someone dies, when someone someone walk, walking into the building said, you know, I'm and we do this. This is a, depicted in the movie where uh, a very a vocal atheist uh, says, you know, my mother died. Mm-hmm. And this is a source of, of my atheism. But yet, see, atheism, look, atheism doesn't take away the pain. It just takes away the hope. So if there is no God then pain and suffering, we're just animals, we're just a product of evolutionary struggle. That's just the way things are, as Richard Dawkins says. Mm-hmm. But if there is a God, then that means is that there's, there, there's at least something we can understand how to, how to handle things, how to have hope. For every bad act that is committed, there's massive more good acts of people responding and caring for their fellow man. So almost greater than the problem of evil is the problem of good. What is this thing inside of us in humanity? I mean, why would we blame God for all the suffering, but not give God the credit for the millions and masses of people that reach out and comfort and encourage their fellow man and and let me fellow humans? uh, Yeah, I mean, there's so many questions. What about uh, this this idea? I mean, you talked about hope. Uh, Some people would say that. I mean, I'm only I'm playing devil devil's advocate here. You know, hope is just you know people just having some hook that they can hang on to. I'm interested in also in the notion of, oh, there's going to be a second coming. There's going to be, uh, you, you know, this world is going to end. I mean, is this, is this 
for you really true? Well, I mean, science will tell us that one day the universe will burn out. Uh, you know, the, the fire, if, you're, if you have a fire in the fireplace, you can tell when you put a lot of wood in it that it's burning down. Uh, I do believe that Christ promised he would return. Uh, and we're to long for that return because in the end, what happens at the second coming of Christ uh, is, is a judgment. In fact, this is a very clear statement in the scripture where he said, God, the apostle Paul said, God furnished proof of this judgment by raising Christ from the dead. But what that means really is there's an accountability. There's going to be a day where everyone who's ever lived, whatever, whoever you are, will stand before God and give an account for our lives. And so what that should produce is the same thing that knowing you're going to be audited by the, in our country, the IRS or, you know, by your government, you know, there's an accountability, you know, there's a court waiting on you. That's why you get into the news of whatever you do in secret, one day you're going to have to, to stand an account hmm. and give an account for that. And that's, if that's true for our lives that keeps and restrains evil, how much more is it collectively for the world that knowing that there will be that kind of accounting one day. Well, Rice, you've been brilliant uh, in terms of just answering my questions. I really appreciate you Thank coming you so in uh, this morning, Dr. Rice Brooks. Uh, his book is God's Not Dead, Evidence for God in an Age of Uncertainty, and the film is out next week. Uh, you make up your own mind. I will come to your calls straight after the news, but for, uh, straight after the travel, but first, here's the news with Shauna McCarthy. <laughs> London's headlines at just after.